Okay, so we basically start from where we left. Uh, okay. So yesterday in the very last part of the of the lecture, we were discussing about coordinate partitioning, namely the division, uh, the categorization of the generalized coordinates which describe a system into independent and dependent coordinates uh, as a consequence of the uh, uh, analysis of the constraints imposed over the system. So here we have, again, we, we assumed to have NC dependent coordinates uh, as a result of NC constraints equations. And uh, again, as a consequence, N minus NC independent coordinates, where N is 6 times NB, where NB is the number of bodies in the 3D space. Okay. Um, so let's then assume, we actually assume that uh, we were only considering uh, polynomial constraints, uh, having this uh, expression, and we considered a virtual displacement having this characteristic of being infinitesimal and complying with constraints. As a consequence, also the constraint that, as we said, were meant to still hold uh, after the displacement could be rewritten as such. And eventually we arrived at this point where we define a Jacobian uh, of the constraints as a result of the virtual variation of the constraint equation uh, with respect to, as a consequence of the uh, virtual displacement mm, associated with the generalized coordinates. Uh, we, there, we therefore introduced this matrix, and we said that this matrix is typically uh, rectangular because it would be squared if we had that the number of constraints equaled the number of parameters used to uh, describe the system. But this is not typically the case, because if this is the case, sorry for the repetition, we would have uh, an isostatic uh, system, which is typical for uh, city structures, but not for mechanisms which are meant to move. Uh. That's why we typically have a labile system and a rectangular matrix as a consequence, a, a rectangular Jacobian. With n here, the number of columns typically uh, larger than the number of uh, rows. Uh, so the rank of this uh, matrix is at its, max, uh, at its maximum nc, so it has full row rank, if uh, the uh, constraint equation which are associated to this Jacobian are linear independent. Okay, this is where we arrived. Uh, as a consequence, as a consequence uh, of this, we can do the following. Uh, so we, we, let's finish this uh, small part of the lecture, and then we continue. Uh, I can define the following coordinate partition. I have my vector of generalized coordinates divided as qi, the vector of independent coordinates, and qd, the vector of dependent coordinates. Eh? So where qi are the n minus nc independent coordinates. And QD are the NC dependent coordinates. Okay. Uh, therefore, I can rewrite
the equation dc over dq times delta q equal to zero as cq, and this we already seen, delta q equal to considering this partition uh, c q i delta q i plus c q d delta q d equal to zero and now please take into account the dimensions of this uh, of these matrices. So this was, uh, we said it, and um, NC times N matrix is an N times one. Hmm? Sorry, uh, yeah. Well, this, the independent one is an N minus NC. Vector n minus nc uh, matrix, and this is an nc times one uh, vector. It's a column vector. Okay. And here instead we have NC times NC, that's QD, and here we have NC times one. Okay. So we just have decomposed, okay, if you want. Uh, so, um, this CQI and CQD are just some matrices uh, of our Jacobian. So let's write it down. So our C, QD, and C, QI are sub matrices. of the Jacobian CQ. Uh, um, the important thing is that if the NC constraint equation are linearly independent then c q d uh, is non singular okay And therefore, we can invert it. So we can rewrite C QI delta QI plus C. Q D times delta Q D equal to zero becomes we can invert this, okay? And you can write delta Q D equals 
minus C Q D to the minus one applied over C Q I times delta Q I. Uh, and this, this, this matrix here is typically denoted as C Q D I. Okay, which is a matrix. This we can do uh, because this is not singular. So the minus one. Uh. As you can see, here we have somehow related the dependent and the independent coordinates. In fact, they're virtual variation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. This is actually quite clear, no? So this is, we have said it's NC times NC because this is the number of the constraint equations. This is NC times one. Okay. Uh, just a second. Um, uh, sorry, no. Uh, 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 uh. So, in fact, if this is true, when we do this is this is zero. This is a scalar, okay? So this is a scalar, all right? In fact, this is n c times n, and then you multiply, you apply over n times one, okay? Uh, no, sorry, this is still no. I'm getting. Uh, no, sorry, here, here. Uh, this is, um, <clears throat> Is the number of n okay? No, I'm sorry. This is n okay. Uh, this is n and one. Okay, this is n c. Sorry, this is n c. This is n c. Okay. All right, so that this is true. And so this is NC times N minus NC. This is NC, min, uh, sorry, N minus NC. Okay, the vector. And this is, of course, NC times one. Okay. Okay. Okay, and of course, in this case, you have, uh, you can also apply it here if you want, uh, and it makes sense. So here we have NC times one. Okay, here you have this. Is, this is a square matrix, so it's always NC. So you have, uh, I don't know where I can write it. It's NC times NC. This is NC times N minus NC, and this is N minus NC times one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so again, we got this, which relates um, independent and dependent coordinates. 
and as we have already in fact introduced, these QI are called degrees of freedom of the system. Uh, so these are degrees of freedom of the system. Also referred to as do f s. Uh, not just the not just the virtual variation, but the QI, the independent one. Okay. These are referred to the degrees of in, why they are referred like this. Because in fact, uh, if there are no independent coordinates, the system is isostatic, it cannot move. Uh, so in this sense, it makes sense say that the system has no degree of freedom uh, left. So that's why they are called like this. Now, we will uh, um, make use of this definition with an exercise. So we will devote today's lecture to an exercise. OK, all right. Uh, but to do so, let me just uh, so I will save this. Allow me to, to do this. So allow me to do this. Uh, yeah. And then we will start another board, OK? Only with the exercise. We will see basically, we will analyze a um, slider crank mechanism, which is typical mechanism. Uh, which, which you can find in the analysis of multiple uh, of system of multiple bodies, still rigid bodies. And uh, we will see how the constraint will derive the constraint and we will assemble the Jacobian. OK. All right, so let's do it. Uh, get a new one. OK. All right. So. Uh, again, coordinate partitioning. And we have an example. The example is the following. Uh, there you go. So that's, this is the mechanism that I was talking about, okay? So you see we have four bodies. So one is this column here. Then we have a second body here, third body here, and a fourth body here. Okay. The constraints. This is fixed here. Okay. While the body number four can slide over the uh, over this plane, you can typically highlight this constraint like this. So this is a tray, a carello. And then we have what? Three hinges. We have a hinge here, a hinge here, and a hinge here. Okay. So again, the name is slider crank mechanism. And the observation that we can make are we have four bodies, meaning that since we are in the 2D plane, we have how many coordinates, generalized coordinates? Well, it's so in 2D, you need three generalized coordinates to completely define the position, the orientation of a body. Okay, here we have four bodies, we have 12 coordinates. Hmm? Uh, 
OK. Second observation. We have five constraints. Hmm? We have one fixed constraint or ground constraint. Uh, then we have three hinges. And then we have one tray. Again, so this is the fixed boundary condition. The hinges were denoted like this. And the tray, it's this one. So how many, so we have five constraints, but as I mentioned yesterday, do not get confused between the number of constraints and the number of constraint equations. Because typically one constraint can be characterized by more than one constraint equation. So the number of constraint equations. Uh, so fixed boundary condition. How many equations? Well, three, no? To prevent, to limit variation of two coordinates for the position, one for the rotation. So three equations. Then we have hinges. Hinges have two. So two equations. So times one, this is the count is three. This is times, so we have three hinges. We have three, so we have six constraints equations. And then we have a tray. How many equations for the tray? Why? Is it clear for everyone? Because basically you prevent the rotation and the displacement in the normal direction, but this is still allowed. Okay. So two equations times one equal to two. So in total, and C, the number of constraints is equal to. 11. OK. So. Here we have. This is our N. Huh? And this is our NC. So let's count what are the degrees of freedom. Left. Uh, so this is also called the uh, Grubler's count. Uh, so Ni, which is N minus NC, is equal to 12 minus 11, 1, D O F. So the system has one degree of freedom. Does it make sense? Yes, uh, because eventually what you do is that with this mechanism again, you provide rotation uh, to one uh, or a torque now in O here. And what you get eventually is a, a translation of this mass in body number four. So Yes, it makes sense. You only have one degree of freedom to vary. Now we do another stuff. We assign the generalized coordinates to each of the body to describe them. So let's uh, prescribe these 12 coordinates. Again, the um, 
scope of, of this exercise will be to assemble the um, Jacobian mm, of the system and see what the uh, CQD or CQI matrices are. And how it is important, how relevant it is to correctly choose the um, independent parameter, the degrees of freedom, because we have said already, so here we have one degrees of freedom, but the choice of the degrees of freedom, so the choice of which one of these 12 coordinates can be set freely, is arbitrary. You can do it, uh, you know, as you want, but this has consequences, and we will see that these consequences may be very important. Huh? All right, so let's assign the generalized coordinate. OK, so body one. Which is the bracket. Eh? So in this picture is the bracket. OK, so it's the link. Of the uh, mechanism to the ground. Uh, we call it Q1. Yeah. And this is, as expected, R1, 1, R2, 1, and theta, 1, transpose. So here, please do not get confused between the uh, subscript, which, is, which enumerates the component, so R1 and R2, and the superscript, which instead refers to the body number. Okay, in fact, uh, it would be more correct to, to use it as a subset here, Q1. Okay, not to get confused. And again, as you said, a rigid body in 2D space, three coordinates. Same for body number two. At the crankshaft. So it's this body going from O to A. Huh? We call it Q to O. And as usual, it's R1, R2, and theta 2. Transposed. So we, we're really doing this step by step because I think it's useful really to, to see it all. Yeah? And we have the body number three, which is this connecting road. So it's, it's this one, we're going from I, A to B. And it's three, and still we have the same formally the same vector. Eh? And then the last, which is the mass. Eh? Body number four. It's a sliding mass. It's Q for R1, R2, theta, 4. All right. So the vector of the, of the generalized coordinate is the vector Q, which is just, uh, the, uh, comes from the assembly of all of this. So we have R1, R2, theta. And we have R1, R2, theta. 
R1, R2, tita, R1, R2, and tita. 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3, 4, 4, and 4. Okay. You want, we can use the commas here just to be more clear. Okay. Okay, now let's write down the constraint equations and enforce them. Okay. So again. Okay, first, the ground constraint hmm? Well, the ground constraint, if you go and check the drawing, we have that R1 of body number one is equal to zero. Remember that this is the, com the component associated mm, to the uh, to, to the um, global frame of the first body. Okay, along again, this is the horizontal coordinate. So it's this one, uh, just for you to get to get the gist of it. It's this. Uh, of the of the origin of the local frame. So you see here we have four we have four body frame because we have four bodies, and this is the co the translation of point O if you want. Okay. So as a result of this constraint of the ground constraint, you have that this translation must be prevented. Also, the vertical translation must be prevented. And what else? Also, the rotation must be prevented. So these are the three equations that we have thought of before. So ground constraint. Then we have the hinge at point O. Uh, So the hinge at point O can be written as such. So we should uh, write the position of point O. Hmm? And what is the position of point O? It's R1 huh? of body one plus A. Sorry, no, it's not R1. Let's say let's write it in uh, in vector uh, in vector form. Of body uh, number one of R zero one of point O. So this is the vector which defines the position of point O in the local frame of the of the first body. Okay. This must be equal, this we have already seen it, to what? To the position of the same point, but described with respect from the perspective of the second point, which is linked through the hinge. Okay, so R2 plus A2, R0 over bar of point O, but associated to the second point. Okay. Okay, and this must be zero. Okay, why it must be zero? Because 
Oops. Oh, yeah. Let me just check. Ah, yeah, I didn't write it. Um, um, yeah, I go. We wrote, uh, this is, I forgot to, to write it. We can assume that our uh, global frame basically has its origin in O. Okay, so this is X1 and this is X2. Uh, so I'm just doing a dotted line here, just not to completely uh, cancel out uh, the logger frame. Okay. Then we have the injured point A. Okay. Well, in this case, we have that the position of point A described with respect to point to body two, so R zero of over bar of point A hmm, described with respect to point two uh, must be equal. To the same point, but uh, described with respect from the perspective of, uh, of body three. So R R zero over bar A of body three. Okay. Can we write equal to zero now today? Yeah, sorry, in this case, no. Right. In general, no. But we can do the following. We can instead of writing this, we put a minus here. Put a minus here, and we write equal to zero. This we can do. Okay. Uh, let me just write them all in the same uh, page, huh? if you want. So. Okay. So then we have the tray. Actually, we have the hinge at point B. And this is just the same, basically. So we have that R3 plus A3 of R0 of point B over bar, the sky with respect to the 3 minus R4 minus A4 of R0 B, point four is equal to zero. Okay. It's just the same of what uh, we have just uh, written. And then finally we have the tray. So you see, we actually have 11. 11 equations. The tray. So this is kind of easy as well to write. So the fourth body has to have is vertical. So the first, the, the fourth body has to have is vertical displacement. So two constraint. So equal to zero. And as a consequence, also its rotation must be prevented. So theta. 4 equal to 0. Okay. 11 equations. All right. Now, what we want to do is to express using these constraints, we want to express the independent the dependent coordinates as a function of the independent ones. So that when we set the values of the independent ones, we automatically get the values of the dependent ones through the constraints. 
let's do it. Okay, so. Um, we have, as we have written just a few minutes ago, that this holds and through coordinate partitioning, we have CQI, delta QI, plus C cube D, delta QD, equal to zero. And therefore, our delta Q D is minus C Q D to the minus one times C Q I multiplying delta Q I. Hmm? Okay. So to get CQ D and CQI, we have to get the Jacobian. Huh? So to express the QD as a function of the QI, we need to uh, calculate the Jacobian. Hmm? Um, do you guys mind if I open uh, the door? It's not really an idea in here. A little bit smelly. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's find uh, this uh, CQ. Um, So to do so, we rewrite the constraint equation in uh, matrix form, okay? The constraint equation. In matrix form. Okay, so for example, ground constraint. We are seeing that basically we have that. Um, R1 is equal to zero at all times, and theta one. Uh, uh, if you want, like, let's actually write it like this. Q1 is equal to zero at all times. Uh. Therefore, it's also true to write that the virtual variation of Q1 is equal to zero at all times. No? And this we can write it like this. Delta R11, delta R12, and theta1, delta, they are all equal to zero. Okay? Right? So let's write now in matrix form. Well, it's kind of easy. 
we have delta R11, delta R12, and delta theta1 equal to 0. 0, 0, 0. And this is, I would say it's 1, 1, 1. Okay, super easy. Now let's do the same for the, the rest. No? Hinge at point O. So here we have R2 plus A2 of R0 O2 is equal to 0. We apply the delta, the virtual variation, and we get delta R2 plus well, here we have a product, a matrix product, so we have to apply the chain rule. So we're going to have delta A over delta theta 2 times delta theta 2 applied over R0 2 of O equal to vector zero. So please note that here, what I did was basically apply this delta over the entire, uh, over the entire equation. But so this is here. But when I apply it to the second term, this is constant. So it cannot uh, it cannot vary. So it's a, it's a fixed because again, the body here is rigid. So the only thing that can vary in this matrix process is a. But does it does a is a is a, a function of the position of r1 r2? No, it's only a function of the of the angle theta two. So that's why I wrote it here. Okay. All right. I just uh, shorten if you want this. So if a two is the typical rotation matrix in the 2D plane that we've already encountered, we should have cosinus of theta 2, minus sinus of theta 2, sinus of theta 2, cosinus of theta 2. And therefore, a theta 2, which is what we call this term here, A2 with the subscript theta is just the derivation, the product of the derivation of this matrix with respect to theta 2, which we all know minus sinus of theta 2, minus cosinus of theta 2, cosinus of theta 2, minus sinus of theta 2. Okay. With R0, 2 of point O equal to, for example, uh, if the length, uh, let's say, let, let's do this. Um, that's the same, uh, it's the same uh, system, no? If we call the, the body number two, as a length L2. So this is, this is the body number two. And we say that this length it's L2. Now well, let me actually rewrite it better. It's L2, hmm? 
and that the origin of this body, of this uh, local frame, is exactly in the middle. Okay. So the position of point O is what? Is minus al2 divided by 2, 0, transpose. Because remember, you see here we have an overbar over R0. So these are the components in the local frame. That's why it's minus L2, because here with point O with respect to the local frame is minus, minus L2. Okay. Uh, well, again, we have that OA as length of L2. So the length of our uh, second bodies is L2. All right, now let's write it in matrix form. So let's call this equation, equation one, okay? So in matrix form, equation one becomes One zero zero one L two divided by two sinus of theta two minus L two divided by two cosinus of theta two apply to what delta R one two delta R two two Delta theta two equal to zero zero. Okay. Two scalar equations, in fact, it's an hinge, no? Okay. In the same way. We can derive the expression for the hinges at point A and B. Uh, so, and B. We have the first one is R2 plus A2 of R0A2 minus R3 minus A3 of R0A3 is equal to 0. We use a delta here. And we have delta R2 plus A of theta applied over R0 over bar 2 of point A times delta theta 2 minus delta r 3 minus a theta 3 applied over r 0 over bar of point a multiplied by delta theta 3 is equal to 0. Okay, I just applied this to this. And the same goes with the other one. So we have uh, 
R3 plus A3 R0 over bar 3 of B minus R4 minus A4. So this is up here. R0 4 of B is equal to 0. Use the delta operator. And we have delta R3 plus A theta E3 of R0 B3 delta theta 3 minus delta R4 minus A4 theta R0 B.4 delta theta 4 equal to 0. Okay, it's just the same. With, of course, as before, R0 of point A seen from the perspective of body 2, in this case is L2 divided by 2, so positive, huh? 0 transposed. We have that R0 always regarded by the, from point 3 in this case, Body T of point B is similarly L3 divided by 2, 0. Mm. And then the same point A, but regarded from body 3, is minus L3 divided by 2. 0, and the same point B, but regarded from the body 4, is 0, 0. Why 0, 0? Because if you, if you check, body point B is the origin of the fourth coordinate uh, system. Okay. So let's write it in matrix form. So hinge at A, we have the following one, zero, minus L two divided by two, the sinus of theta two, minus one, zero minus L3 divided by 2, sinus of theta 3. I'm just really rewriting uh, what I just wrote before. And the second row is 0. You can verify your stuff, but uh, I think it's pretty obvious. 0. Minus 1 and L3 divided by 2 cosinus of theta 3. Multiplying what? Well, as usual, our generalized coordinates for the hinge, which are delta R1, 2, and delta theta. And again, delta R1, delta R2, and delta theta, but body 2 and 3, 2, 2, and 3, equal to, again, 2 scalar equations. And the same goes for the hinge at B. Okay, let's write it. Very, very similar, of course. It's one, zero, 
this is L3 divided by 2 to the minus sinus of theta 3 minus 1, 0. And then we have 0. Here we have 0, 1, L3 divided by 2 cosinus of theta 3. 0, minus 1, 0. And here, the coordinates are, of course, the following. These are the body 3, and four, which are linked. So we are going to have three and four are subscript. Okay. Last thing that we need is the tray. To, to write in, uh, in matrix for in matrix form the tray. Can I slide? All right, in this case, we had R1, R2, sorry, on body 4 and theta 4 equal to 0. We apply the delta operator, and we get the following. And in matrix form, Zero, one, zero, 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 one. Applied over delta R one four, delta R two four, and delta theta four equal to zero. Okay. Now what we have to do is to assemble all of these matrices here, the coefficients. And we will get the Jacobian. Hmm? OK, let's do it. So it will take some time, but uh, I think that it's informative. Hmm? So. We assemble the Jacobian. C Q of the system. Remember that we have to we are writing the following CQ times D Q is equal to zero. This is what we are writing. Huh? So, okay, so let's get this. CQ is this, so it's a very big matrix, which will take some time to write. So, one. OK, so this is the first column. So do you, do you understand how, how am I actually assembling this? So if, it's like if I'm writing this with all the Q here. Huh? OK, all right. 
So I'm just putting together all the matrices that we have just uh, obtained. Okay. Okay. You can try to do it by yourself just to check if I'm doing it correctly. So this is L2 divided by 2 sinus of theta 2 minus L2 divided by 2 cosinus of theta divided by 2. Again, minus L2 divided by 2, the sinus of theta 2. And L2 divided by 2, cosinus of theta divided by 2. Now the rest is 0. Okay. Okay. Let's continue. Okay. Here we have minus L3 divided by 2 sinus of theta 3. L3 divided by 2 cosinus of theta 3. Minus L3 divided by 2 the sinus of theta 3. And L3 divided by 2 the cosinus of theta 3. 0 and 0. And then the rest is as such. Zero, zero, zero. Minus one. And then finally, okay, and, and this is all. And as you can see, it's an 11 times 12 matrix, okay? So again, this is the matrix that when multiplied to the delta Q, the total that we have defined, gives exactly the matrix, the relationship that we have derived constraint by constraint. Okay, it's just a way to rewrite them all together. Okay, so, as you have seen, we have, 11 relationship, but 12 generalized coordinates. And here, this point, we have the important, to me, point of all this lecture. We have to choose which one we would like to have as an independent parameter. So this, the parameters between all of the 12 that we have, 
that we would like to set freely so that all the rest come as a consequence through the enforcement of these constraints. Okay. So if you look at you know the picture, the draw, the drawing of this mechanism, the natural choice would be to set as uh, independent parameter the rotation of the body number two. Because again, this mechanism is another huh? this mechanism is another way to convert rotary motion into translation of the mass. Okay. So the the quantity that, that you set independently is the rotation huh, of this. Okay, it's the rotation of this. So this rotates and this translates as a consequence. So the input comes from theta two, what we call theta two. Let's let's see what happens if we do this. So let me just state clear that the choice of the independent uh, coordinate. Is arbitrary. Okay. So let's choose theta two huh, as independent as our QI. Okay. In this case, what is the CQI? The CQI, in this case, remember that the CQI has the following dimension. NC times the number of independent parameters, and I. So it's an 11 times one. It's a vector, in fact, in this case, no? But what is it, this vector? Well, for theta two, theta two, let's go and check. Did you remember that we set the vector of generalized parameters at the very beginning of this exercise? Let's go back and find it even if this takes some time. Ah, where is it? I think it's in the very first page. Oh, there you go. Theta two, all right. So which number of coordinates is it in our definition of Q? Is the one, two, three, four? No, it's the sixth, sixth. So it means that we have to take the sixth column of our Jacobian. Okay. Sixth. Let's do it. So one, two, three. Four, five, six. This is our CQI. I hope to just try. This is our CQI. I will rewrite it huh? because again, so uh, theta two, which we choose as our uh, independent parameter, is the sixth coordinate in our CQ. Huh? So let's write that theta two is 
the sixth element in our vector of generalized coordinate. QI, okay? So CQ is the sixth column of CQ, of the Jacobian, okay? Let's rewrite it. It's zero, zero, zero. L2 divided by two sinus of theta two minus L2 divided by two cosinus of theta two minus L2 divided by two sinus of theta two. You see there is a rotation. Eh? These are the rotation uh, components. L2 divided by two cosinus of theta two, and then we have four zeros. Okay. Uh, if this is CQI, what is CQD? All the rest. Okay. So CQD is what is left. of C Q uh, Jacobian after removing CQI, okay, or extracting, if you want, that's a little bit better. Sixth element, sixth column. Of course, if we had two degrees of freedom instead of one, we should have extracted what? Two columns, huh? and we should, we should have had that the rest would have been CQD, and that's it. In fact, CQD, as you can see, it's now a square matrix as it should be 11 by 11. Okay. Okay. Please allow me to continue. So we finally write that our D Q D is equal to minus C Q D to the minus one. We can invert it because it's a square matrix. And it's, and it's non singular. Mm, let's see. C Q I delta Q I. So you see now this is only one uh, underbar because it's a vector and this has no underbar because it's a scalar. We only have one. This is delta theta two. Huh? So you see here, you set theta two, and you get all the rest. So you get all the configuration. So you get all the parameters that describe your configuration of the system as a consequence. You just set a scalar, and you get all the rest through just enforcing the constraint. Okay. Now, please. Let me consider the last part, and here I really wanted to, to prove a point. So as an alternative uh, choice, choice of the QI, 
let's choose uh, for example r14 as independent coordinates so you see what, what is it r14 is the horizontal motion of the mass of the sliding mass so it means that we are basically trying to make work the mechanism in an opposite way as it should because typically you prescribe a torque so you prescribe the, ro the rotation you know, of the crankshaft and you get the mass moving in horizontal here we are doing the opposite we, we are prescribed we are trying to drive drive the mechanism enforcing an, an horizontal motion of the mass to get you know the crankshaft to rotate okay so it's kind of not how the mechanism is supposed to work. And these are consequences. Let's see. So in this case, CQI becomes, oh my God. Should be okay. Okay. This is CQI, which is just what? So R14, I think, was the ninth coordinate. So this is the ninth column of CQ. Uh, I think it's the ninth because the uh, the tenth would be the vertical, and then the eleven. Oh no, yeah, yeah. So sure, you're, you're correct. Yeah, that, that's the tenth. That's the tenth. Then we have the eleventh is the vertical. Then the twelfth is the rotation of the fourth body. Okay. So this is the tenth column. Uh -huh. So this is the tenth column of CQ. Tenth element of Q. Huh? But on the other side, CQD becomes singular for these values of theta. Theta 2 equal to theta 3 equal to 0. Meaning that it is not possible to write uh, Let's actually write it. Uh, so we can't write delta Q D equal to minus C Q D to the minus one C Q I delta Q I. Uh, because this cannot this inversion cannot be done. But what is the meaning of this? Let's see what is the configuration of, of my mechanism for theta 2 equal to theta 3 equal to 0. Well, I'm afraid it's this one. See? Does it make sense or not that you cannot get all the rest of the configuration uh, imposing just a translation because this is stuck you see it's completely stuck you cannot just impose this horizontal translation to try to rotate this so so what is the lesson that you have to learn here 
that when you, pre when you design a mechanism or a system of multiple bodies and you have a certain number of constraints and you have, as a result, a certain number of degrees of freedom, the choice of the degrees of freedom that you want to use to drive that mechanism may affect critically the functioning of that mechanism. So if you use this mechanism to convert rotary motion into translation, no problem at all. If you, use, if you want to use this mechanism to translate, to um, translate uh, horizontal motion, to transform horizontal motion into rotation, you may end up in this condition, which in turn results in, into an impossibility to define. You see, you, this means that you cannot define the, all the other components, all the other parameters of the system when, when you set this. Meaning that you cannot drive it. So that's the lesson, important lesson that you have to get home from this lecture, okay? And, you know, this is, you know, a condition that you can get for this configuration. If this configuration is not the one that you are starting with, it, it can work for a certain point of, uh, you know, for a certain uh, amount of time. But then when you pass through this, and here we are not considering yet. So this is all uh, not considering inertia, uh, because then if you have inertia, somehow this can help you out uh, to unstuck you know, this mechanism. But for now, let's consider that we are in a quasi-static quasi -static, uh, configuration. There is no way to escape from this. So keep this in mind when you will have to design mechanism. Uh, because this can happen. All right. So this is all for today. Mm -hmm. Beh, la, la questione è che come abbiamo visto la CQD, la CQD, I'm, so I'm, I'm actually answering in English. So he, he was actually saying, is there a way to anticipate this problem? Huh? Or, or we actually can realize this only once we have chosen the independent parameters. The answer is that unfortunately, yes, you have to first choose the independent parameters because af only after that you can properly define the CQD and eliminate the columns associated to each independent parameters. And then you can see if it's uh, singular or not. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, that's not completely true. I mean, it's true, but it can be confusing because if you choose, if you calculate the rank of this matrix, you can also uh, encompass the problem of not having linearly independent uh, constraint equation. So the singularity of this CQ of the Jacobian can be due to two facts: to a to a let's say a singular configuration, or to uh, of our two um, non-linearly uh, non dependent constraint equations, okay? So if you say, okay, look, the rank of this matrix is smaller than NC, as it should be. What is, it, what is it, the reason? The reason is that you can have a singular configuration or that you can have uh, uh, two, rows, two rows which are just a linear combination of other two or more, okay? So what you say is true, but let's say you can do this if you already have ascertained that all of the, your constraints are linearly independent. Okay. Is, is it clear what your colleague has said? Okay. That's it. <laughs>